and welcome to episode 11 of Radicals and Conversation, a podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. In this month's episode, we'll be exploring a key element of the contemporary capitalist system, the logistics sector. Today's global economy relies on the steady flow of goods, products and raw materials around the world. Companies like Amazon have become so massive that they now ship as many as 400 packages per second. But this all depends on the labour of millions of workers in docks, warehouses and logistics centres. If the global supply chain is broken, capitalism grinds to a halt. I'm Chris Brown and I'm joined today by three guests who are all experts in the field. Jake Ali Mohammed Wilson, Professor of Sociology at California State University, Long Beach, and co-editor of Choke Points, Logistics Workers Disrupting the Global Supply Chain, which was published by Pluto this April. Katie fox Hoddis, a lecturer in Work, Employment, People and Organisations at the University of Sheffield. And Kim Moody, founder of Labour Notes and the author of numerous books on US labour, most recently On New Terrain, which was published by Haymarket in 2017. He's also a visiting scholar at the Centre for the Study of the Production of the Built Environment at the University of Westminster. So Jake, Katie and Kim, thanks to you all for taking the time to come on the show today. Perhaps you could start us off by giving us a brief explanation of some of the key ideas that we'll be discussing today. What is the logistics industry and who do we mean when we talk about logistics workers? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, when, when we think about logistics, so I, I think a lot of um, consumers, in especially a, a consumer capitalist you know, society, whether it's London or Los Angeles or New York, um, think about capitalism or think about workers, we often forget about oftentimes the invisibilized workers. And those are the workers that move the goods. And so, you know, if you, if you order something on Amazon and it arrives on your doorstep, uh, there's a whole chain of workers around the world um, in the logistics sector that move those goods. So from the point of production, uh, any good that you buy in a retail store or an online e-commerce firm goes through a lot of different workers' hands. Um, so, you know, starting from a production worker, it'll be loaded onto a pallet into a container. And there's 6 million, I believe, containers moving right now around the world, often on massive cargo ships. Uh, the container is placed on a, uh, usually the back of a truck, a chassis, and brought to a port. Port workers, dock workers, longshore workers load those goods onto a massive container ship. That seafarers, another logistics worker, move the goods to another port. From there, their dockers will unload the goods and uh, either port truckers or rail workers, both logistic workers, uh, will move the goods to a distribution center, a warehouse, where another group of uh, logistics workers is toiling in a warehouse, um, and those are warehouse workers. And so I think looking at the ways in which goods are moved is, is one of the things we're going to talk about today. And the logistics sector has become a, a key element in you know, the modern just-in-time global economy. So, I mean, perhaps you touched on it there, but why is the logistics sector such a vital potential choke point, which is the name of the new book, uh, in the capitalist system? Yeah, so I, I teach in uh, Long Beach, California, and I started researching labor and logistics kind of in my own city. Long Beach is a port city in uh, Los Angeles County, and the port of Long Beach and the port of Los Angeles are next-door neighbors. I mean, there's some invisible dividing line between them, um, but they're operating independently. But to collectively, about 40% of all goods uh, trade entering the United States enters through that choke point. So that is a, a site in which a node in global capitalism where goods uh, have to go through this one corridor. Um, and so that is kind of how I, I started studying kind of the global process of supply chains and, um, you know, the just-in-time system. And I think, you know, Kim's book uh, really speaks to this, that time has become very much a part of modern capitalism today. And Numerous industries, not just the logistics sector, but, you know, many other forms of, of labor are being transformed, um, whether that's at a university or a hospital, that workers are being um, oftentimes measured um, by time. And so getting back to logistics, we see a rise of these large retailers, um, whether it's Walmart or Amazon, you know, making new billionaires and uh, very wealthy people in large part about their dominance in the logistics sector. 
just to add to that, I, I um, certainly agree with everything that Jake said. I just wanted to take a sort of step back and think about it a bit more in, in kind of global historical perspective. Um, why has the rise of the logistics uh, industry been so significant for global capitalism? And why do workers in this industry have such potential power? And I do think that power is is potential in the sense of it's in most locations it hasn't really been actualized yet, and I hope that's something that we'll we'll get into today. But if we look at um, sort of changes in the global economy since the Second World War, you have logistics, which um, actually started out as under the purview of the military, right? Logistics was a military science. And it was only after the Second World War that um, people in the business world started to think about uh, logistics as something that might be a component of competitive advantage. And over time, um, kind of particularly since the 1980s, for companies, transnational corporations that are heavily engaged in moving, um, in, in uh, trading commodities internationally, logistics is, is sort of the key element of competitive advantage. So that's where the power comes from. Global commerce, as we know it today, simply couldn't exist without the, the logistics industry. So if we look... Um, you know, prior to the the 1960s and in many parts of the world, uh, more recently than that, the way goods were moved previously was was so different. So you'd have um, goods produced in, in a single location, packaged up in a variety of different ways, taken to ports in a variety of different ways, repackaged every step of the way. Um, so logistics didn't move in, in such a smooth way. And so what some of these big corporations like Walmart were able to figure out, um, and others, and the U.S. military through um, through the Vietnam War in particular, was that if they could um, introduce some technological innovations, in particular containerization, they could make this whole process go many, many times more smoothly, and that this would give them a, a huge advantage. So these, these sites... Um, of global logistics, like warehouses, like the docks, um, they depend on very quick movement, what Jake called um, just in time, right? Ideally, the goods don't spend any time sitting around. And, um, and ultimately, that's the source of this competitive advantage. So this issue of time is what potentially gives um, workers in this industry um, a lot of power, right? Because if you're able to disrupt an industry that is absolutely um, dependent on moving things quickly, uh, there are huge potential losses for the employers. Yeah, I think there, there's another dimension to this as well that, that I find fascinating. And L.A. Long Beach is one example of it. And I recently uh, got a tour of the area around Chicago where these huge warehouses and intermodal yards are, uh, all of them are less than 10 or 15 years old. I mean, these things are all brand new. The, the way they've organized, uh, not on purpose probably, but the way logistics has ended up being organized, you know, is, is around these huge what, what are called clusters. And as I say, L.A. Long Beach is an obvious example. Chicago is another one. It's interesting. Somebody told me this. I don't know if it's factually correct, but they said that Chicago, although it's a very small seaport, Great Lakes Seaport is the largest container port in the in the U.S. because it's kind of at the center of all this movement. Now, the interesting thing to me about these clusters is that they're all based around large metropolitan areas. They all draw on what you might call the reserve army of labor that is mostly workers of color, men and women, who come into these warehouses in particular uh, really in the last 10 or 15 years, as I say, this is a lot of this is so new. So in, in the Chicago area, the official estimate is, let's say there are about 160,000 people in this re logistics uh, related cluster. Now that's actually an undercount because they don't count rail workers and they don't count all the IT workers. There, there are a lot of other groups that are not counted there. So an alternative count is that there's something like 200,000 warehouse workers alone. What they've done in effect is recreated what capital business in the U.S. tried to destroy 30 years ago when they moved out of big cities away from places like Detroit or Gary or Pittsburgh and from the West Coast for that matter with the automobile industry to get away from these huge clusters of 
blue-collar workers, basically, particularly unionized ones and particularly workers of color. Now, in order to move these things that are more spread out than they used to be in terms of production chains, uh, they have recreated these huge concentrations of low-paid workers, not all low-paid, obviously truckers, rail workers, and many of those are are better paid, but they've created this huge uh, concentration of mostly blue-collar workers. The problem is, and I think uh, Katie was getting at this, that the unions, although there is organizing activity going on, and perhaps we can get to that in a little bit, they haven't really learned to uh, function together. This is actually in uh, Jake's book, in the article by Peter Olney, he points out that the, the unions in obvious places, like in L.A., why aren't, why aren't the longshore workers helping out the port truckers more? And we can go through these examples. Uh, fortunately, there are some positive ones too. But uh, nonetheless, there is this, I think, enormous opportunity because these, these clusters are choke points in, in a very real sense. If you stop even a relatively small percentage of the activity going on in these places, uh, you back up the movement of goods, the economy, and and so forth. And so I think one of the good things about the way people have begun to think about logistics as a global thing is to kind of get away from the old way that we looked at it in quantitative terms of trade and foreign investment and financialization and all these things and down to what is really the backbone of how capitalism functions uh, on a day-to-day basis. So I'll I'll say two things about this. Um, The first is about my experiences um, working in the trade union movement in the United States. And the second is based on my experiences as a labor researcher, um, largely outside of the United States. So my my first job after graduating from university um, 12 years ago was as an organizer for the ILWU, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, um, which is the, the sort of powerful Port work and and warehouse workers union on the, the west coast of the United States, which has um, a long and storied history as a particularly left wing union um, within the U.S. context, um, particularly in Northern California and um, you know the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm from. And my experience as an organizer, I worked on uh, an organizing campaign at an inland warehouse. So um, this was the Blue Diamond Almond Factory in Sacramento, California, uh, the largest almond factory in the world. Um, California is the largest almond producing uh, place in the world. And the majority, vast majority of the almonds are exported through the ports. And so the union had identified this as a strategic organizing target for very good reason, right? The, the almonds are processed and immediately taken to the port for export. So there should be um, a good deal of leverage through the the supply chain. And yet, um, though this was a hard-fought campaign with um, many um, amazing worker activists um, who really put years into this, um, ultimately it was unsuccessful. And I think... uh, you know, the reasons that it was unsuccessful have a lot to tell us about the the difficulties of organizing in this sector in places like the United States. First of all, warehouse work in particular tends to be heavily dominated by agency workers or subcontracted workers, which creates um, a whole other set of issues for organizing. Sacramento, though, it is a quote-unquote union town, very high union density because it's the state capital with lots of public sector workers. Nevertheless, workers there faced tremendous challenges, and, and these have to do with the very weak labor law regime that we have in the United States. So the company racked up um, dozens of labor law violations, what are called unfair labor practices in the United States, and essentially just got a slap on the wrist and was able to get rid of, um, you know, key activists or discipline key activists and really thoroughly intimidate a workforce that was already divided between um, subcontracted and permanent workers. Um, There were a lot of older workers, so people in their 50s and 60s, who really didn't see a lot of other options for themselves in the economy. Workers from many different um, ethnic backgrounds and immigrant communities. So many of the the problems there, I mean, JQ and and Nabonisic identified these same issues in your book, Getting the Goods. But I think that these are important to keep in mind. And then, and then this is the United States, right? 
My research on on dock workers over the course of the past um, six years has been focused in um, Europe and Latin America. And I've actually interviewed and participated in international dock worker meetings in 20 different countries. So I think what that global perspective brings in is as difficult as things are for workers in places like the United States or here in Great Britain, they're so much more difficult in most of the rest of the world. And I do think we have to be really careful in thinking about that, particularly when we talk about logistics workers and the potential power that's there. The potential power is there because of their position in the economic system. But there are so many other contextual factors that are shaping the possibilities for workers in this sector to organize. And some of those contextual factors, in particular, the role of the state, is determinative. And it's it's so difficult to overcome. So in, um, for example, in Colombia, where I've done research, I mean, this is the most difficult context where I've conducted research. Colombia is the most dangerous uh, country in the world for trade unionists. Trade unionists are uh, regularly assassinated even today when things are actually quite a bit better than they were several years ago. And dock workers in Colombia simply don't are not unionized. So though they actually um, historically had a very strong national unitary union, because of the privatization of the ports in the early 90s, the union disappeared overnight. And there have been um, sort of fragmented, uh, very small-scale attempts to build unions, heroic, heroic efforts. But, you know, if you're facing... um, what's essentially state-sanctioned violence by extra-state actors, the challenges the challenges are clear. So I, I think it's important to talk about the potential power for workers in this sector, but when we, particularly when we look at the global context, we have to really, um, we have to be real about the challenges that are there in really in most of the world in this global industry. And I think that's one of the things that... Um one of the strengths of choke points is it's it's looking at a lot of different global struggles. So as someone start who started research in Southern California, moving beyond that was a really important part and looking at how struggles, whether it's in you know uh, China or uh, Palestine or uh, Chile, Turkey, uh, Greece, uh, these are all case studies that that you know are examined in this in this book. And Katie has a really good point, and it, we have to be very specific in a lot of times. So when you talk about state violence, you know, and I wrote a chapter in here with Spencer Potaker um, on Palestinian truck drivers. And for, mm-hmm. in Palestine, there's, Israel destroyed the port construction. So there is no port. It's a historical, you know, trading, you know, seaport that was destroyed. The airport was destroyed. So the only way to move goods is via truck. And, but there's not, it's not really a containerized kind of a smooth process. It's restricted by Israeli violence, you know, and uh, these security checkpoints. And um, so for Palestinian truckers, their kind of class exploitation cannot be removed from racism, anti-Arab racism and Zionism. And, and it's violent. It's, it's absolutely state violence. Um, so, you know, it is much more complicated when we get into the cases. And uh, that's an excellent point. Yeah, I think the state thing is... Obviously so true in the United States as, as well. It was interesting when I was talking to people at the uh, cluster, the center point, which is a major warehouse cluster outside of Chicago, and they, the group there, Warehouse Workers for Justice, which is backed by the United Electrical Workers, a small union without huge resources, uh, they did manage to pull off uh, some strikes in 2013. There was also one on the West Coast at the same time. And an interesting thing is after this strike went on and became actually effective and they were able to bring in something like uh, several hundred or perhaps a thousand people from outside to actually shut down the Walmart warehouse there, which, by the way, if you've ever seen this thing, is quite a trick because this thing is city blocks long and wide. I mean, it's, it's incredibly massive. They managed to do that. The government brought in the anti-terrorist unit. All of a sudden, these warehouse workers, many of them immigrants, became terrorists. Uh, so the state does that. Even at a, at a less violent level, American labor law makes all these things incredibly difficult. And of course, the Trump NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, has even undone some of the things that 
uh, had been done by Obama and so forth that would make it slightly easier. It's very difficult. And for example, the Warehouse Workers for Justice have been working in these warehouses now for a decade. This is their 10th anniversary, not to the day, but to the year. And still, the UE has only been able to organize a couple of warehouses. Uh, it's not impossible to do it, but it's extremely difficult. And when you're coming up against, those tend to be smaller ones with larger portions of direct employees, fewer temps, and, and so forth. When you come up against Walmart, not to mention Amazon, you know, you're talking about 60 percent temps, agency workers, and enormous turnover. Uh, some of the warehouse workers I interviewed that had worked in this Walmart warehouse had also worked in virtually every other warehouse in the area. People move from one to another, hoping that it will be a little less bad than the last place they, they went or that it would pay a little more. So turnover is a difficulty. Labor law is a problem. State violence is a problem. My thought on this is that what is going on now in some of these places is this kind of grassroots development of leadership. This is actually the way they put it. Is what they're really trying to do is develop enough of a leadership core in some of these warehouse workers so that at some point you'll get the kind of explosion. Remember that when unions grow, certainly in the U.S., but I think this is generally true, at least in developed capitalist countries, they don't grow little by little. They tend to grow in explosions, in upsurges. And the upsurges don't come out of nowhere. They almost always come out of years of people trying things that don't work, learning what might work better, and so forth. So the optimistic view of this would be that that's what's going on now, and hopefully the uh, the time will come when this upsurge takes place. Uh, sometimes I compare this to hotel workers where you have a similar thing. You have uh, a lot of the same problems. You have an immigrant workforce. You have enormous turnover. But again, the interesting thing is the turnover occurs within the same industry and within the same geographic region. So at some point, these workers become familiar enough with the whole way the, the industry is structured in their area that what the organizers are, are trying to get across, and I don't just mean the professional organizers, those who are organizers among the workers themselves, uh, begin to make sense and, and the possibilities open up for some kind of upsurge. Yeah, I think also thinking about, Katie, you mentioned the potential for you know, worker power around the world. Um, thinking about also logistics and the just-in-time economy is also a site of struggle where labor can play a critical role in supporting other radical movements, anti-racist movements and anti-colonial movements, et cetera. There's a long history of that, precisely that, and you know that more than anyone, I'm sure, um, thinking about how dock workers around the world have used their structural power to resist, whether it's apartheid or racism. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about kind of solidarity and, and working with ILWU in the Bay Area around, you know, whether it's Block the Boat or some other historical examples. I think for, I think a lot of us, when we think about capitalism, thinking about those kind of intersections of struggle, right? And um, one thing I've learned since I've been in London, I've been here the past few months uh, on a visiting teaching position, is that uh, a number of leftist movements here are really doing interesting things around some of that stuff. You know, I think about how uh, Black Lives Matter went to the airport or the Mall of America, right? Looking at where folks are organizing is also another thing I think we can bring in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this question of um, dock workers um, supporting but also being supported by other movements on the radical left is so interesting. And one thing that I've come to feel very strongly through my research, I, I, I started out interested in researching dock workers unions um, because of this, this issue of structural power you raise, right? Because of their kind of material position in the global economy and the potentialities that created. But I think that what makes um, dock worker unions so interesting is that that for whatever reason, in many parts of the world, they've tended to be particularly politically radical and engaged 
beyond the workplace. So, you know, there's so many examples of this from the United States. The the ILWU um, has a history of this going back to um, really since the union's founding out of the San Francisco general strike in the 1930s, you know, refusing to load arms to fascist Japan and then refusing to, to load weapons during the Vietnam War and um, similarly showing support for the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa all kinds of racial justice work in, within the United States and um, more recently with Black the Boat in support of Palestine. But this is true outside of the United States as well. So um, I think one of the most interesting examples here in Europe is um, the Swedish uh, dock workers union, the Svenska Hamna Beter Förbundet, which is um, one of only a handful of independent unions in Sweden. Quite, quite radical and a, a very um, interesting organization. And they played a major role in the Freedom Flotilla to Gaza. And like many, many of the other uh, rank and file dock worker union leaders I know in Europe have been very active in um, work supporting immigrants and refugees, anti-racist work um, more generally. So that's one contemporary example from Europe. Um, And then from two sort of related examples from recent struggles in Greece and Portugal. So the Greek dock workers have been engaged in a fight for several years against port privatization, which was something that um, the the Troika had been trying to impose on the Greek state um, as a result of the economic crisis. And, you know, the Greek dock workers could have taken the position that well, it, it really doesn't matter to us whether the port is public or private. What we care about are our working conditions. But they instead, in, in the port of Piraeus outside of Athens, built a really strong community coalition based around, first of all, the principle that ports should be public. They're part of the sort of wealth of the nation. Um, they should be, you know, people's ports. And particularly in a country like Greece, where there are endless numbers of small islands everywhere and people rely heavily on the ferry system to um, stay connected, that particularly in a country like that, the the port should be public. So they built a a community coalition, very strong, and as part of that um, work in the community coalition have been heavily involved in anti-fascist organizing in Piraeus and in supporting immigrants and refugees. So I wanted to give what I think in many ways is really the most... um, impressive case that I've looked at in my research, which is a case from the Global South, the Chilean dock workers, who in 2013 and 2014 organized um, month-long strikes covering nearly all of the ports in the country. And I think that it's important to give this example as a kind of um, caveat to what I said earlier about the Global South. Generally, conditions for worker organizing in the Global South are much more difficult. And yet we see these um, amazing examples of workers not only taking these huge risks to organize, but also succeeding. So in in Chile, um, the dock workers don't actually have a national union. They have a sort of national kind of... Uh, network organized along sort of anarcho-syndicalist principles of mutual aid. And they have a very clear understanding of their strategic role in the Chilean economy. They really understand um, and have deeply internalized this idea of the ports as choke points. They are incredibly strategic in terms of thinking about how and when to wage struggle. So they um, have struck in the in January, which is the fruit and vegetable harvest in uh, Chile, a country that exports a huge number of fruit and vegetables, big industry. Um, they were incredibly strategic about making sure to secure the key copper exporting ports, uh, again, a huge part of the national economy. And um, they adopted a, a principle that ports on strike would not accept diverted cargo from one another. And in engaging in this struggle, they were um, seeking to win, you know, basic uh, bread and butter demands for their members, but they were much more farsighted as well. And what leaders there told me, the real, um, the most important contribution of the strike was that they were able to essentially force the Chilean government to engage in tripartite collective bargaining at the national level for the first time in Chile since before the dictatorship. So one of the the main ways that the Pinochet dictatorship broke the unions was by moving collective bargaining from the sectoral level to the company level. 
Um, so there's no basis currently in Chilean law for sectoral level bargaining. But by organizing in such a powerful, strategic way, they were able to reestablish that precedent in the country, which is just absolutely incredible. And they did that in part through building um, really strong alliances with the student movement, with teachers, with other unionized workers, through international um, support from dock workers outside the country. So um, I think it's a, a wonderful example for illustrating the potential that's there. But again, the the potential is realized through the workers um, themselves and through their decisions organizationally. Um, just to turn it around a little bit, and I think that's all absolutely right, how in this case, again, going to Chicago and the Warehouse Workers for Justice, how they, as a group that is not able to use this kind of power yet, uh, used community alliances, broad social movement alliances, to win things that they couldn't win necessarily yet by direct action. Now, they have won things by direct action. Uh, maybe I'll mention one, one thing in a minute. But one of the interesting things is they fought for a number of laws, and they actually won one in the state of Illinois, which is uh, not a, a liberal state at the moment. They, they actually won this law that gives part-time uh, temporary agency workers certain kinds of rights, including the right to bid for full-time employment, which they didn't have before. doesn't mean they'll get it, of course, but you know they have these sorts of rights that is now explicit. They won this law by creating this coalition, which included things like the Chicago Teachers Union, you know, and speaking of left-led, radicalized organizations, community organizations that were working on such diverse things as housing in the black community and Latino communities, schools from outside the schools and, and so forth. So that, that was an important thing. Uh, more recently, just really a couple of weeks ago, they've, they've constructed a coalition. Amazon is trying to open a second national headquarters outside of Seattle. And of course, they're getting every city in the United States to, to bid for it, giving them, you know, zillions of uh, dollars in, in tax breaks and everything like that. So the warehouse workers for justice are now, they're not trying to stop Amazon from building this thing in Chicago. But what they're saying is that if it's going to be there, A, there'll be no tax breaks. B, they must provide uh, money for black and brown schools there must be jobs for people of color at above minimum wage. I forget the exact wage they called for, probably the $15 an hour thing. But the point is they created this or were part of this coalition that allowed them to, to enhance their power. In a strange kind of a thing that they're doing, the Warehouse Workers for Justice again, they've linked up with community organizations around the Joliet region, which is where these huge cluster of warehouses is most concentrated, to actually stop the development of a new warehouse cluster that developers want to build. You know, well, why do warehouse workers want to stop this? Well, actually, the reason is that they're going to overbuild in this area, there's, you know, there's only so much you can do in, in terms of the traffic that comes through there, the congestion. And the communities don't want this thing there because of the hundreds of trucks that roar through their streets, the pollution that's come with this, which is astronomical uh, and all of that. The workers, or at least the activist workers in this and some of the unions, uh, don't want this thing, as I say, because it's just going to... Um, you know, create overcapacity, uh, which will put downward pressure on, on pretty much the, the whole industry. Whether they succeed in stopping this thing or not, I, I have no idea. Uh, my guess is they won't because the developers rule. Again, the irony here is on the side of the developers, of course, are the building trades unions who have done extremely well. There's no getting around it off the building of uh, all these warehouses. And I was interesting to find out that they, these developers were actually using union labor. I would have thought they would have circumvented that. But they have the building trades unions on their side in this fight. So labor, uh, once again, gets divided. But I think this idea of, of using coalitions is important. But they also have used direct action, uh, not only the 
strikes that um, 2013 and, and some others, but uh, things that go on in the warehouses. Up until recently, if you worked in the Walmart warehouse, you got paid per truckload, either loading it or unloading it. And you had a crew, so you had to split the money, you know, which meant you, you had to work extremely fast and unload or load more trucks. Uh, it's very heavy work. There's no technology here. It's, it's all by hand, except maybe the, the identification of the boxes and so forth. The uh, Warehouse Workers for Justice, in alliance with the United Electrical Workers and some other things, by doing some smaller types of actions, have actually gotten rid of this and forced an hourly wage on not only the third-party logistics firms that run these warehouses. Of course, Walmart doesn't run it. They get somebody to run it for it, and then somebody else hires the workers. But now they all have to, uh, in most of the warehouses, they have to pay an hourly wage. So they they can win things. But again, the, the big power isn't there yet. So coalitions are important and will remain so. Yeah, I, I think it's really key. And um, it reminds me of um, some years ago, I guess over a decade ago, in Los Angeles when the Staples Center where the Lakers and Clippers play basketball, when, when that was being you know negotiated in the city council to be built, where labor built a lot of partnerships with community members to have guarantees around jobs and resources in the community. It was, it was a nice coalitional effort. Similarly, in the warehouse uh, sector in the Inland Empire of Southern California, Sherry, our founders of uh, the Warehouse Workers Resource Center, they had a, a, a march against Walmart. So warehouse workers march, and they called it the Wall March. And uh, it was kind of the, the peak of this campaign they have to get back wages uh, that were owed to the workers. There's a ton of wage theft in the logistics sector. And uh, I think they ended up winning uh, over a million dollars in back pay, and that probably didn't cover it all. But it, it was a it was a good victory. And I'm thinking about Chile again. Um, I just read a really good book by Carolina Bank Munoz on Chilean uh, Walmart workers, and there's some some real hope uh, and promising case studies around the world when we think globally. And so. She looked at uh, both uh, Walmart retail workers in Chile and uh, a warehouse sector, and uh, they've, they've made some, uh, some impressive gains. I wanted to pick up on this um, question as well to sort of follow up on um, what Kim was saying about the community coalitions. And one thing that I, I've come to appreciate, again, I sort of started from this position of, well, dock workers have all of this structural power. They're sort of a self-contained group of workers, right? Like they have they have enough power by themselves. From what I've seen, that's really never the case. So if you look back to the, the founding of these dock worker unions um, in places like the United States, and here in Britain, um, these are unions that were founded out of general strikes. So by definition, they were heavily reliant on their um, surrounding communities. And you have to think about the fact that historically this work was not only totally deregulated, but totally casualized. So, And still is in many parts of the world. So these were jobs where people show up at the terminal early in the morning and try to compete with other workers to get a day job. So it makes sense that they they really needed the support of the whole community, even to form their unions. And what happened eventually in most of these places is that um, in order to really sustain themselves as unions in the logistics industry, state regulation plays a huge role. And we see this really clearly in a couple examples. One example from the U.S. is the trucking industry. Deregulation of the trucking industry, a uh, key uh, example of uh, neoliberalism and labor in the United States, has had an incredibly damaging effect. You know, many similar examples in the UK, but the one I'm most familiar with is the, the deregulation of the ports. So UK dock workers are still almost without exception, unionized. And it's not to knock their organization in any way, but the the strength of the historical organization of dock workers, I mean, this was one of the strongest unions in the country, very strike-prone, um, heavily politicized. And, um, you know, that kind of an organization was really broken by Thatcherism. So this, this question of logistic workers' power, it can go both ways, right? Things can get better and they can also get worse. And um, whether they get better or worse 
has a lot to do with the the role of the state, which ultimately comes down to questions of class struggle in the broader society, not just in the workplace. But this question of community coalitions is really important as well. And what I've seen is from looking um, at these cases around the world is that logistics worker unions, dock worker unions that become isolated do not succeed. And one of the most kind of helpful insights I got through interview research was from my friend Erik Helgesen, who is a leader in the Swedish Dock Workers Union at the Port of Gothenburg. And he made a really interesting point about choke points, which is that, yeah, you know, we, we have a lot of potential power and our employers in the state are every bit as aware of that as we are, if not more so. And it puts a target on our backs. And that has to be part of the story, too. In fact, the dock workers at the port of Gothenburg, the largest port in Scandinavia, are now engaged, I think it's over 18 months, the dispute they're having with um, APM Maersk. And so that limits their ability to do other things as well, like, you know, support things like the Freedom Flotilla, which I spoke about earlier. So this question of the state, this question of the community coalitions, I would just, um, building on what Kim said, just argue that these are always important. They're important for every single category of logistics workers, you know, whether they're the workers that appear the strongest or the weakest. Uh, just a slightly different point. Going going back to these clusters, which I, I think are, are key, even though they don't all involve dock workers and they don't all have that kind of concentrated worker power. One of the things that's demographically happened in, in the U.S. is that these these clusters uh, are metropolitan wide, but most of the actual warehouse and transport work uh, is in the suburbs. But suburbs have changed radically in the last twenty or thirty years. They're no longer white flight places. If anything, they're Latino flight and they're black flight. And now many of them are well over a third people of color. These are working class communities. I mean, there are middle class communities. There's still segregation among the different suburban units and all of that. But the transformation is really important. And the workforce is part of the reason this has happened. For example, the town of Joliet, which is where this huge center point warehouse cluster is and, and transport cluster, has grown by 50 percent in the last 12, 13 years or so, 15 years. And its racial and ethnic composition has changed radically. So the issues, the other social issues that we're, we're sort of getting at when we talk about alliances and everything are being brought into these areas whether they like it or not. Um, and the issues, whether it's Black Lives Matter or immigration rights, these are all there. And they're there in the warehouses. They're not just there in the communities as well. I asked them, well, what are the main issues? And they talked about the hard work and the wage theft, uh, you know, and all of that. And after that, it's discrimination, sexual harassment. All these things are there. The union or the warehouse workers for justice uh, in these situations has no choice. I mean, it wants to do these things, but it has no choice but to do them. Uh, you know, whether that was their original plan or not. You know, it's important to understand this, that the nature of what a labor organization will be in these warehouses that, that are so concentrated is going to be different than what we think of trade unions 20, 30 years ago in the United States and, and so forth. The, the way one of the organizers for Warehouse Workers for Justice, a Latino guy who grew up in Joliet, described it to me, you know, the pressures of life in this city, in this little city, as well as in the warehouses, have transformed radically. And you just sort of have the sense that someday, just as there can be riots in the inner city, there can be some kind of explosion. We're going know what kind, but some kind of explosion taking place in these new suburban areas, not just around Chicago, but all these major uh, new clusters. One thing we've looked at before on this show is the new so-called gig economy uh, and organizing amongst these non-traditional workforces. I wonder how the uberization of people uh, in the final dispatch stage of the logistics chain ties in with the more traditional choke points. Um, what challenges does it pose for organizing and how are people trying to address those challenges? 
And just today, I was at the park with my children, and we heard some drums pounding, and we see in the streets IWGB marching. Mm -hmm. And so we ran and talked to them and got on the march. And I spoke to a delivery courier and um, reminded me, I last week I, I was in Paris to promote choke points, and um, I was on a panel, and it was a really interesting panel. It was two warehouse workers and a delivery courier. The delivery worker uh, was talking about in a sense, kind of feeling abandoned, if you will, by some of the big unions, but at the same time, energized by some of the creative actions they're they're taking up. Um, a number of the cyclists got together in in Paris uh, to one of the largest restaurants that you know uses their services and uh, had a wildcat strike. Um, what was also interesting, the warehouse uh, worker. This was an Amazon worker that I was on a panel with in Paris. He. He was very interesting in, in kind of how he viewed uh, organizing. And one thing that uh, he was talking about, um, I mean, he was talking about all the, the terrible working conditions that I think are pretty well publicized now. Skipping bathroom breaks, physical toll on your body, management by stress, and um, just the toll. He was, he was, I think, in his early 50s and just talking about how that his body has been impacted. But um, he seemed to think that one idea that they're going to start to try and grow is how can consumers act in solidarity with some of the warehouse workers? So we said if we go on strike, we don't want folks to boycott. We want the load to increase, right? We want it to become an unmanageable for Amazon to deal with volume if we have a slowdown or if we go on strike. And he said, in fact, what we're trying to implement next time, if we go on strike, we want the public to get involved with ordering massive quantities of goods and canceling 50 minutes later. <laughs> and it would, he said it would shut everything down. You know, just, just these creative tactics, if you will, that are being explored because workers might not be being organized by some of the more mainstream uh, unions. I think there's some also potential there that to me, I was just really excited to hear some of these strategies. So I wanted to come back to your, your question of um, organizing the supply chain and basically just ask, like, what do we mean by organizing the supply chain? Why do we why do we see the supply chain as the sort of most relevant space for organizing? And I think that there are a couple reasons. Um, you know, you have sort of established unions at certain points in the supply chain who potentially have resources or um, expertise or the ability to organize it political will being a whole separate question, but there's a question of resources there. Another issue that's often pointed to with this idea of organizing the supply chain is using these strategic leverage points in the supply chain in solidarity with workers at other points. And there's a tremendous amount of potential there, and then there's also a lot of problems with that. So in a country like the United States, where solidarity strikes are pretty much illegal almost under almost any circumstances, there's a question of, well, how do you do this? How do you use the strategic leverage if you're um, on the docks or you're a truck driver or a, a rail worker that's, um, that's unionized to support warehouse workers? Um, that's not to say that there aren't creative ways to do that, but it's a serious issue that we have to contend with if we, if we really want to think through how do we use these choke points. So one question is within countries and the sort of... Um, uh, legal and other constraints that are in place that make it very difficult. On an international level, in a lot of ways, it's actually more um, more optimistic. So the the organization that I study, the International Dock Workers Council, is a um, autonomous international organization of um, of dock workers unions, quite left wing, quite militant. And um, it's often at the international level between countries rather than within countries that we see the most effective use of choke points in global supply chains to support worker struggles elsewhere. Here, just outside of London, at the London um, Gateway Port, which is, had been a non-union port, uh, it's a, a new port, Unite the Union was struggling to organize there. Um, dock workers in Spain basically refused to handle cargo from the first ship that lo that left this port. Um, something very similar happened. Um, uh, a recent case in Paraguay where um, dock workers were facing massive state repression. The Uruguayan dock workers at the mouth of the Rio Plata boycotted the ship. So, so this ability of dock workers to boycott ships can be incredibly powerful. The problem is that... <laughs> 
The reason that dock workers often rely on that is because they're so constrained within their own national context because of, you know, state repression or the state legal infrastructure that they they have to rely on um, their international allies. So I just always ask people to sort of critically interrogate when people talk about organizing the supply chain, what are the actual steps that you're imagining people will take within the supply chain and how feasible are those steps or how do we actually make those things happen? Yeah, I, I think it's such a good point. And a couple of days ago, I met with uh, the maritime uh, organizer at the ITF, and we we're talking about seafarers. And if all logistics workers are semi-invisible, I think seafarers are among the most invisible, you know, because we can drive by a, a warehouse, whether, um, you know, outside the urban center uh, or a port if you are uh, near the coast. You know, the case of the seafarers, I think looking at what's happened to, you know, global shipping, right? And so you have... Um, a massive increase in global shipping, these mega container ships that are operated and run by a small group of workers who um, are facing the v- very similar yet very unique circumstances that are very important um, around states, around laws, international laws. The vast majority of seafarers um, uh, around the world are from the Philippines, followed by uh, you know, India, China. There's a, a large number of you know, seafarers from northern Europe. Um, to be on, on board ship uh, for nine months at a time, right, uh, mm-hmm. on a contract when the vast majority of seafarers don't have oftentimes union contracts um, or dropped off at a port, oftentimes abandoned, you know, thinking about where they fit in as, as a group of workers in uh, organizing the supply chain is so complex and yet so important. And I think thinking about state violence, again, kind of back to your point earlier, like, for example, Indonesian seafarers have particular face uh, uh, unique cir- circumstances of who they are as workers. You know, they, they face a lot of Islamophobia, were refused shore leave uh, countless times in a lot of cases of uh, the last decade in the United States of just because they're Muslim or from a Muslim country and being interrogated. Um, and so there's a, a lot of key challenges that I think we can also link together other struggles. But it's very complex. <laughs> And it's not as simple as saying organizing supply chain. Yeah, absolutely great point. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think we often overlook railroad workers. And, you know, there, there's something terribly untrendy about them. And I don't want to go into what it might be, but they think about these things too. I, I went to, a, at the Labor Notes Conference, the, there was a group called Railroad Workers United, and they, they try to do some rank-and-file work in these various craft unions. What the interesting thing, though, is that this is a group of workers that in the United States, in labor law, has the right to do secondary boycotts. That means that unlike even dockers or truckers, they can uh, recognize picket lines without the excuse of, oh, I'm in danger or anything. It's perfectly legal for them to do that. I know of one instance where they did this In the 90s, there was a strike of steel workers in Warren, Ohio, and they they went to the railroad workers and they said, if we go on strike, will you not bring in the ore? Will you not take out the steel? And it's no problem, you know. Uh, So we have to think about how to do that. And one of the problems is, of course, that in terms of connecting this to warehouse workers is that trains don't go to warehouses. There's an intermediate step there, and that is the truckers. Nonetheless, think about if there is a UPS strike later this year in the United States, which is not impossible. The role that railroad workers could play in terms of that, the potential there for you know choke points galore, is huge given the amount of freight that has moved from the West Coast to Chicago and to the East Coast and over the land bridge and all of this. Great point. Yeah. I think we've run out of time now. Um, Thank you very much, Jake, Katie and Kim. The two books which, again, we've been drawing on quite a lot in the discussion today are Choke Points, which came out in April with Pluto, and On New Terrain, which was published by Haymarket last year. Both very much worth going online and picking up a copy. So thanks once again to the three of you, and also thanks to you at home for listening. Uh, If you like the podcast, then do please leave us a review on iTunes and share the link with your friends and political networks. And just to keep you on your toes, for anyone who does review the show, we'll also be giving away £30 worth of Pluto books to one randomly selected person. 
uh, and we'll announce the winner in the next episode. So do tune in again in August. Thanks. <laughs>